Well, thank you all. This is Kelly, and thank you so much for joining our session. Um, it is titled Speech Recognition as AT for Writing, a Guide for K-12 Education. And we are just so thrilled to spend the next hour sharing with you our tips and tools for considering, teaching, assessing, and implementing speech recognition with students. These are our learning objectives that we um, set forward here. So you can breeze through those really quick just so we can move forward <coughs> on the good stuff. And before we get to introducing ourselves, which we are going to do in just a second, I want to clear up why we're calling it speech recognition. Um, so some people call it speech to text. I hear that a lot. Some people call it voice recognition. The teacher I used to work with insisted on always in calling it dragon speak, even though that was actually really the old old name of the program. Um, and then, so speech recognition is the the word we stick with and the one I prefer because I feel like speech to text gets easily mixed up with text to speech. People are inversing them all the time. Um, and it, more than just recognizing a voice, like a sound, it's recognizing our speech. Awesome. Okay, now who are we? Um, as I mentioned, my name is Kelly Key. And I, my primary role is the Assistive Technology Coordinator, and I work for Barrington School District in Barrington, Illinois. This is my 14th year in this current role. This is actually my first year full-time Assistive Technology. In the past, I've been the one Assistive Tech Coordinator, and I've also been an Administrator the past 13 years. So I was an Assistant Principal as well as a Special Services Facilitator and the Assistive Technology Coordinator. And um, prior to that, my background is a special education teacher, and I'm just so passionate about sharing what works in our district with others. And I'm Dan Cochran. I'm uh, also an assistive technology specialist and coordinator for um, my district, which is only about, oh, how far is it from yours, is Kelly? About an hour drive an hour. south or 45 <laughs> minutes, something like that. Um, we had to go to ATIA to meet each other. That's our joke about getting together and doing this, uh, <laughs> putting together this guide and presentation. I've been the full-time AT specialist for 10 years, and then part-time before that, one day a week for five years while I was a special educator at a, an elementary building. Um, I'm also currently an adjunct faculty member at the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago for our online AT certificate program. And I'm also quite involved with RESNA. I was um, immediate past chair of the RESNA Professional Standards Board that governs the ATP and ATP SMS credentials. So on to the presentation. The first thing we want to address is the question of why we think a guide is needed at all. Speech recognition is universally available and students can use it whenever they want. They don't need to have an IEP or a 504 plan or even ask their teacher permission. So between the voice typing feature in Google Docs and the speech recognition that's built into mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, it's freely available to many students if they have those devices. So it's the ultimate in universal access. Um, we could just say, well, why not let just students discover it and use, their, use this tool on their own? Well, and yeah, the reason for that is because you really don't want this to happen. Um, when putting together one of our presentations, I saw this and I couldn't pass up putting it in. Um, it's the gentleman using speech recognition, and he says, hey, come here, check out my new speech recognition program. And up on the screen types, hey, severe, chicken, manure, peach, recognition, grow ham. So even though our technology really has come a long way, and between that and um, after you, the, the key is really learning to teach students to use speech recognition. So between the improved technology and after seeing how to really teach students to use speech recognition and assess whether or not it's working for them, hopefully this will not happen to you or your students. Well, and another reason that we wrote the guide is that speech recognition is still assistive technology for some students. So just because any technology, whether it's text-to-speech or word prediction or speech recognition is universal, doesn't mean it's not also assistive technology legally. It needs to be documented as AT if it improves the functional capability of a person with a disability, as you know from the definition. And speech recognition, if it's effective, would be a type of accommodation that you would doc document on an IEP, potentially an accommodation that can be used on high-stakes testing, too. 
Um, currently, we're part of the Park Coalition in Illinois uh, for state, uh, the high stakes testing, although that's apparently changing next year, so stay tuned. But uh, speech recognition is allowed at this point. Um, it may also be allowed on in your uh, state tests, I'm not sure. You'd have to check with your state to determine. But either way, for high stakes testing or as an everyday accommodation in the classroom, we think the team needs data to determine whether speech recognition really is effective for a student, and we're going to talk about that today. So I'm assuming you're familiar with the federal IDEA mandates regarding AT. Just want to point out here that legally AT is not just a device, but also a service. And that's also what we're focusing on today in this webinar. We're going to talk about how to fit speech recognition to the student in a sense, how to train the student and the adults who support them, whether um, we're talking about the professionals in the school or their family members. Okay, so a couple times now we have mentioned our guide. So this is something that you can have access to for free. If you have not already accessed it, you can type in this Bitly link at the top. It is case sensitive. Um, and you can um, print out a copy of it as well. There's a little button on there that you can click on it and print the PDF. It is a live um, version, so any changes we make are automatically updated. So it's definitely something to check every once in a while. Um, but it's, it's a great thing to have in front of you. If you happen to have a copy, keep it open while we go through this. Um, but if you haven't if had a chance to download it, we highly recommend to do it after the session. All right, so we, we have screenshots all the way through here um, that come from that guide, so uh, you can kind of stay with us. So as you open the guide, one of the first things we put in is this page called Tool Belt Theory. And this is just a reminder that speech recognition would never be the only writing tool. Well, almost never. Um, I've always liked the metaphor of a, of a tool belt, and the blogger, or I think he does other things too nowadays, Iris Sokol calls this his tool belt theory. Um, I have the link on the slide and on in the in the guide to to his blog. It's simply the idea that what we need to do is prepare students to have a range of tools, a tool belt of tools, that they can pick and choose from. So this chart in the guide is meant to just illustrate the tool belts of AT features and other accommodations that might be needed for writing. And so just because we're focusing on speech recognition in today's webinar doesn't mean that it's the end all be all of AT tools for writing. Um, Kelly, can you give a quick example of a combination of tools? Sure. So let's say a student has to do a quiz that is available on a Google form. And, um, you know, the first question is multiple choice. Well, they may use a text-to-speech program to listen to the choices out loud, the question and the choices out loud. So that's one tool in their tool that they're using for that one assignment. Maybe the next question then is a fill in the blank, but a short answer. And the student has a difficult time spelling, but they don't necessarily need to speak um, you know, their short answer or their single answer. So they can pull a co-writer or word, any word prediction program, and they can use that as a tool to help support them. Then maybe the next question is more of something that's looking for a paragraph or more. That may be a point where you're going to then use your speech recognition. Um, another thing I teach students is I always want backup tools because if speech recognition isn't available, we've been creative with finding a good place for them to use it or even in the classroom with a really good microphone. But if it is in a situation, maybe they're taking a test and there's no alternative place to go and they can't use it at the time, they, we always want a backup tool. So I have students, you know, um, they, they're very well versed in word prediction as well as speech recognition. So just depending on the student, obviously, it would depend on what tools are in their tool belt. Okay, so our guide is divided up into four sections, consider it, try it, assess it, and implement it. And today we're primarily going to focus on that blue section, the try it section. Also assess it, what we've done is we've built it into our session, so you'll get a good taste for um, how to assess each one of the areas as we go through as well. And um, we will share information from the other sections, but primarily targeting to try it and assess it. And a little bit of considerate. So I think you're probably all familiar with the fact that the AAT process in the K-12 setting begins with consideration because of the legal, the legal mandate to consider AT in the development of all IEPs. 
But here we're talking about considering speech recognition. Now, you know the rule is not to consider a tool first, but in real life it's pretty common with speech recognition. Everyone knows about it. They may have seen commercials on TV, well, this is a few years ago, selling Dragon software around Christmas time. Um, and, you know, I think it's becoming more known that it's in the Google Docs. So it's not uncommon for someone to say, hey, what about speech recognition when a student's struggling with writing? So the task is already driving the AT consideration process, as I think it should. The problem here is writing. What you may need to do at this point is steer the consideration toward an analysis of the task demands of writing. What writing tasks are expected of the student? What outcome level? What are the specific task demands of these assignments or assessments? So we want to know if speech recognition is a really good match. And we don't have time in today's webinar to break this down further, but if you look on page 17 of the guide in the Assess It section, we've provided a list of speech, uh, specific task demands that are related to writing. They include things like the fine motor demands, the visual motor demands, encoding, proofreading, organizational demands, etc. So those need to be considered first, and it's uh, interesting when you start digging into that to figure out what is really going on with a student. Sometimes that information is not available, so it, it's kind of part of the assessment. The next step is to consider the student's performance on each of those task demands so you can identify the gap. So again, you want to know if speech recognition is the right feature to close the gap, because sometimes it's not. And then finally, you want to consider the context or the environment in which the task is done. So you'll recognize these are elements of the set framework, of course. Um, so would speech recognition match the, the environment? It's not a great fit for taking notes during a lecture, and it may be hard to implement in a noisy or a very quiet classroom, either extreme actually, although both Kelly and I have done some whole class implementation. But it's probably a better match if the student can work in a separate space or at the back of the classroom in a study carol or a resource room or just use it at home. So one question that pops up uh, often when considering speech recognition as a match is what sort of performance profile is ideal? So in a nutshell, the ideal profile is a student who has difficulty with the output demands of writing, in other words, the transcription demands and some of the mechanical demands, but has good expressive language skills who can verbally express their thoughts and ideas, and it does help if they have lots of ideas. Right, and Dan and I in the guide, we have outlined some helpful pre-existing skills that we've listed here. So certainly, you know, if the student has clear enunciation, is, has the ability to problem solve and self-monitor, you know, these are some of the things that certainly are helpful for them to have, but we always say that students can be taught many of these skills, so don't, um, don't not try it with a student just because they don't have these prerequisite skills. So, Kelly, how would you know if speech recognition will work for a student? Well, Dan, you know, I always say you just don't know until you try it. So on to our try it portion of the guide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when I first started with um, teaching students speech recognition, I would have them fill out all these different surveys and I'd interview the staff and even have the parents fill out something and you know, we just don't have time for that. So I feel like any student is a candidate, especially because it's universally available. Um, so on to this section, um, like I mentioned, many of these options, many are free, universally available for free. Um, but the key with, to our guide is, regardless of what tool you're using, these are just examples of many that are out there, but regardless of the tool that you're using, it's really all about um, teaching the students to use that tool. So this guide will cover, regardless of what tool you're using, it will work. I did want to mention, I want to mention one new extension I learned about recently, right, because we all like actual little extension things, um, that recently it leverages the Google's uh, voice typing feature so you can use it in other apps. It's called Voice In Voice Typing. It's an extension. Mm -hmm. I think it's in beta form, but it seems to work fine, and it was recently a really nice find for a student who wanted to use speech recognition to make flashcards in a special website and not inside the, the doc. Um, and he, I tried to actually co-write a universal with him, and it didn't, he didn't like it. It was difficult for him to use, um, so now he's using this, this other extension. Nice. But like Kelly said, we're not going to focus on the tools so much. What yeah, we're going to focus on is the process. Yep, the key is really, again, we're probably going to say this throughout, but the key is to teach the students the speech recognition process. You can't assess whether or not it's working for a student and put it on their IEP or 504 as accommodation if you truly don't teach them the process first. So that's what we're going to walk through now. 
And um, so just a couple things before you begin. Uh, the first thing I have on here is plan to work with a student individually versus whole group, although Dan and I both have said we have done in um, a few situations where we've taught a whole class. I've had a student that was completely resistant to trying it, um, but when I walked in and I said we're, I'm just teaching it to the whole class, then he was open to using it, and it was like a miracle. Like light bulb went off for him. It was fantastic. So, you know, the, the, the guy is really designed to work one-to-one -one with a student, but absolutely you can do this with a small group or a whole class as well. The next one is invite someone to attend the sessions. Anytime that I um, am teaching a student, I always try to make sure that there is somebody that can help follow through or works with a student regularly um, that will join us. And um, part of this is really um, not only just for the follow through, but also the comfort level for students, because sometimes using speech recognition um, isn't that comfortable at first around a stranger. So I always have somebody join us, whether it's an occupational therapist, uh, the student's teacher, case manager, and if they're not available, a lot of times I'll even have the parent come, because again, a lot of the times the students are using this at home. Um, and then decide what tool to try first. I, you know, we're very fortunate. We have a one-to-one -one, um, iPads in our district at the lower levels and one-to-one -one MacBook Airs at the upper levels. So I use the tools that I have readily available that all the students have. And then the next one is, if you need to set up the technology, go ahead and do that. You know, if a student has a speech impairment and needs to use something like Dragon Naturally Speaking, uh, we have a lot of tips in the appendix of the guide on how to set up Dragon Naturally Speaking and use that as well. And then understand the speech recognition process. So that's using this guide. And um, you will see through our eight sessions that uh, the students, we will teach them how to do that. All right. The choice of which technology to try first is usually easy, as Kelly was alluding. You try the tool that's most readily available. So in my district, that's the Google Voice typing in a Chromebook, since we have more Chromebooks. In Kelly's district, it might be the built-in speech recognition on a MacBook or iPad, since they're more of an Apple district. But there are a few variables to consider when it comes to the hardware that delivers the speech recognition feature. So we put this chart um, as sort of a thing to think about, I guess, in the guide. There's pros and cons to using a smartphone or a tablet versus a laptop or a desktop. I'll let you read the details on this chart. It's on page 7 in the guide. Sometimes it comes down to personal preference, though. I had a student who would only use speech recognition on his iPhone, even though it was available to him on desktops and laptops. And actually, he's a uh, junior in high school, and he's still just using it on his iPhone, although I'm trying to get him to move toward a Chromebook now, um, but because editing is harder on a small screen. So I usually start with a Chromebook uh, in my district. So before you begin, I do think it's important to understand the speech recognition writing process yourself. When we do live workshops on this topic, which we've done several times at Closing the Gap in ATIA, I usually uh, ask participants here to raise their hand if they've used speech recognition. So <clears throat> most of the hands go up because almost everyone has sent a text message on their phone while driving, or <laughs> I mean when they're in a rush. Of course, you wouldn't text and drive. But then I ask how many people have used speech recognition to write a paper or even an email of some length and most of the hands go down. So if you don't have to use it, chances are you don't. I know that I would prefer to type a paper or a long email rather than use speech recognition because I'm able to type fairly quickly, but I'm also used to being able to think about my sentences as I, as I compose them. When you use speech recognition, the cognitive load shifts to the front end. You have to think about what you want to write and mentally compose your sentence before you say it, which is a different process. And you have to hold on to your sentence in memory while you turn on the mic. And then it works best if you can speak with clear enunciation in a natural speaking manner, which means you have to remember your sentence the whole way through speaking it. So this is not hard for some people, but it can be a real challenge for others. I'm currently working with a sophomore in high school who's on the spectrum, and it uh, very high functioning, but it affects his uh, expressive language. And I've basically been doing uh, one-week sessions all year with him to, to work on just that part of it. So finally, the way we teach it, you turn off the mic and then check the recognition of each sentence for accuracy and fix any errors before you move on. Someone more fluent could dictate several sentences in a row. But it does become sort of an editing nightmare if you let speech recognition transcribe too much text before you check the outcome because it's not 100% perfect as we know. 
So taking all these steps into consideration, we've boiled them down to an easy four-step version. <laughs> and I am all about visuals, um, you know, being a special education teacher. Um, and so I, what we did was we created this visual, and this is both for the staff and for students. We made um, poster size that we'll put like in our classrooms. And then over on the right, you'll see these little mini cards. And what I've done with these is we've cut them out and we've put them on the student's MacBook or um, on their desk. And it's just a nice reminder about, you know, the four-step process that we've taken that and narrowed it down to four steps. Think it, say it, check it, fix it. And it's a great reminder to as we go through and teach them the process and use it. Um, I've also even, on the back of the little mini cards, I've even made like a little editor's checklist for speech recognition for the students to flip over. So the steps of the process are one thing. Underlying them is really the integration of a lot of different skills. Um, and these are the tool demands of using speech recognition. They include the expressive language I was talking about with my sophomore in high school, the generation of ideas, the short-term memory, oral articulation, some, my, some fine motor skills to operate the mic, decoding skills to review the accuracy, editing and revising skills to fix the, fix the errors, and general con computer operation skills, of course, to kind of deal with the device and whatever platform you're using. But we think a lot of these skills can be developed, as we talked about before. So what we're going to do next is really the heart of things. We want to talk about the teaching process we use to develop these skills, because we believe you have to teach the skills to some degree before you can assess whether or not speech recognition is effective for a student. So the approach um, that we take to the teaching process is the common metaphor of a scaffold. So it's a scaffolded teaming, uh, teaching approach. And educators will know right away that this means slowly increasing the cognitive load by starting off with a lot of scaffolding or support and then slowly removing the scaffolding as you build independence, which of course is the end goal. Um, just so you know where we're going over the course of the next 25 slides or so, this is the outline of the scaffolded teaching approach that we have in the guide. This is on page 9. Um, we start with modeling, as all good teaching does. And Kelly, who does a lot of work in AAC, had to remind me of this <laughs> and the importance of this step because I wasn't always doing it, but I do do it all the time now, Kelly. Okay. Um, next, we, we have the student get their feet wet with a single sentence that we provide. So that's a lot of scaffolding. Then this moves quickly to having them compose several sentences on their own, then simple paragraphs. Then in number five, we practice using academic vocabulary in a sentence they generate. And from here, you want to move as soon as you can to whatever grade level expectation it is for writing, depending what the grade is. Usually something formal and more academic. The end goal is independent use on grade level writing assignments. And in a minute, we're going to go through each one of those steps with you. But first, I just wanted to mention this nice, handy guide. Um, this is in the appendix of our guide, or handy sheet. It's in the appendix of our guide. It's just a one-sheet, two-sided reference guide that shows each of the eight steps and a little bit of detail for each. So I originally designed this just as a visual guide for myself, just to remind myself the eight steps that we put together. Um, but now that all my staff has been trained, it's a nice handout for them to just have with them in handy to remind them each of the steps when they're teaching the students the speech recognition process. Um, and we say, even though you have this nice two-sided sheet with some of the details, we definitely highly recommend to go ahead and read through the full guide because we have so many more tips and specific information in the guide itself. I also want to mention before we move forward to step one that the guide was, um, it really is designed for anyone to pick up and use to teach with students. Um, we are, we really follow the building capacity model, not the expert model, but a lot of the examples you will see Dan and I in there, but again, it really is for you to show and teach um, anyone to teach students to use the speech recognition process. <clears throat> okay, so on to step one. As Dan mentioned, it's modeling the speech recognition process. And just like you would, you know, model um, academic writing or model using an AAC device, we like to model what we're expecting from the student. And so what I like to do is right from the start, I model the process. I model it, think it, say it, check it, fix it. And I also model some of those operational skills like turning on the mic, speaking the punctuation and the commands. It's so amazing that if after doing this step, you realize there's a lot less teaching the students because they pick it up right from watching your model. I might start out with a student, um, I always model. I'm giving them tips 
as I'm modeling as well, just kind of like when, you, um, when you're using Dragon and they're, you're going through the tutorial and you're training your voice and it teaches you about it. So that's, that's basically what I do. Yeah, I like how you embed, embed those tips as, you, as you're modeling that. So now on to step two, after we model the whole process for the student, you know, quickly, we turn it over to them by starting with a single sentence that we provide. This eliminates the task demand of composition so that they can focus on the tool operation. So I came up with this fill in the blank sentence years ago and it just seems to have stuck. It works well because it allows the student to personalize the sentence and it's a medium length sentence that tests how well the student can hold a memory, a whole sentence in memory. Um, remember that's an important tool demand of speech recognition. I usually just ask the student for information like what color house they live in and uh, whether it's a noisy or quiet street. And then I tell them, your sentence is, you know, I live in a blue house on a noisy street, whichever variables they gave me. Um, I usually ask the younger sentence to repeat the sentence to me before they turn on the mic to check their memory skills so that we're, um, you know, just rehearsing the sentence a little bit. Then I have them turn on the mic, which I modeled for them before, or in some cases, I've done this, I actually control the mic for them so that the student can stay focused on holding the sentence in memory. It just depends on the student's skills. i uh, worked with a sixth grader that was pretty strongly on the spectrum and we just needed to keep them focused, so I controlled the mic at first. Um, you just have to decide in the moment how much scaffolding they need or don't. And then after they dictate the sentence, I ask them to check the accuracy, as you saw Kelly demonstrate in the videos, either by reading it carefully or by using text-to-speech to listen to it. So Dan, why don't you just go ahead, you know, while you're teaching them, why don't you just have them read out of a book? Well, you know, you, you could have them just read from a book as a practice sentence because that takes away the composition, but I have found that reading from a book totally changes the equation. It, it makes the task demands that are, that are part of using speech recognition into the task demands of reading. And they aren't composing the sentence mentally anymore, but you're going to be running into possibly difficulties with them not speaking fluently or reading fluently, especially if they have reading decoding difficulties. So what you want to see right away is their ability to hold the sentence in memory, not visually see it in the page, you know, and, and be able to hold it there while they, um, before they turn on the mic and then say the whole thing. So that's why I don't have them read from a book. Okay, the next one, next uh, part is, with still with number two is, so let's say they say that first sentence and it comes up, you know, it's supposed to be, I live in a blue house on a quiet street, and it comes up, I live in a new mouse on a riot street. And I always teach students that it's never going to spell anything wrong, but it may have an incorrect, you know, it may put the wrong word. So we look at that, and I tell the students not to change it right now. We're just going to, um, you know, hit enter, and we're going to try again. This is where I go ahead and I coach the student. If there was something during that first sentence that I saw maybe they did incorrect, like they said it too fast or um, they didn't have enough breath support. So I would kind of talk to them as we go through. Maybe we weren't using a mic. We might pop a mic in. So I have them then try it again. I live in a blue house on a riot street. It's getting closer. Um, again, uh, it's kind of nice, too, when you have someone with you. Sometimes when I have the occupational therapist next to me, they'll be like, ooh, let's try and put, a, you know, a, a wedge on their back. Have them sit up a little bit more uh, to help them with their breath support. So just problem solving in between each sentence and then going ahead and trying it again. I live in a blue house on a quiet street. Third time's the charm. <laughs> Now I actually have a video example of um, me doing this. So I, as I mentioned, I've trained quite a bit of our staff on this, especially our occupational therapists are all very well versed in teaching speech recognition. And this is an example during an institute day a few years ago where I was teaching the OTs uh, how to use speech recognition. So that's why I'm here with an adult. And um, this is demonstrating step two. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to actually have you now try it out. And before we do, I just want to find out, what color is your house? Gray. Gray. You live in a gray house. And is your street really noisy or is it kind of quiet? Really quiet. Really quiet. So um, let's put together the sentence, I live in a gray house on a quiet street, period. Can you say that out loud to me? I live in a gray house on a very quiet street, 
period. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic on. Do you feel comfortable saying that out loud to the computer? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Tell me when you're ready. Ready. I live in a gray house. Okay, let's just read it out loud. Press option escape. I live in a gray house on Barry White. Hmm. Okay. That's not so, what I said. Now, let's think about a couple things that maybe we could do to change. Okay. Let's read this one. This time I want you to put your finger under each one and say each word. I live in a gray house on a very quiet period. <laughs> let's see if we can get 100% this time. You can do it. You're doing amazing. <laughs> Look how well I picked it up already. I live in a gray house. Let's read back that last sentence with the computer this time. Oh, all on your own. I live in a gray house on a very quiet street. Fabulous. Okay. So let's talk about some data collection for this step. Um, these are embedded in the assess it section in the guide, um, but we don't have time to cover that section in detail. So I'm going to weave in the data collection tips after we talk about each of the steps. So obviously you can't collect data on the modeling step. So we're starting with the second step, which is when the student starts using the tool. What I'm doing observationally during this step is assessing the student's ability to remember the whole sentence. If they need to chunk it into two parts, that's fine. I, I, I provide the scaffolding on the fly, you know, breaking it into two parts, but I'll take note of that, holding, uh, that holding a sentence in memory is a skill that they need to work on. Second, I'm observing their ability to change their enunciation based on the feedback that we provide as the sentence is repeated two or three times. You can see immediately that some students adjust to the tool demands and speak more clearly. Uh, I was working um, with the student on the spectrum I was telling you about who's in sixth grade, and we had to tell him to talk in his sixth grade voice instead of a silly, squeaky little kid voice that he liked to do. Uh, he could do it and was reinforced when it made a difference in the recognition accuracy, which was much better when he, when he didn't use his squeaky voice. Um, I was just working with a kid today on this, a high school kid, and it wasn't that the his enunciation was really bad, but he saw the difference that it made when he repeated the sentence and did the, you know, without changing each one as we just showed you. So finally, I'm watching to see if they remember to put the period in at the end of the sentence. This is a new skill, so I'm not expecting mastery yet, but it's interesting to see whether a student learns the skill quickly or needs constant reminders. In terms of quantitative data, you could count the recognition accuracy of the sentences. The goal is at least 80% accuracy, I would say, lower than that, and the student's going to become too frustrated. Okay, so on to step number three. This is where we're going to have the student write a three to four sentences on a personal topic. And um, whenever I sit down and first work with a student, especially if I'm meeting them for the first time, I always do a little interview with them. I get to know them. I ask them about their pets what they like to do at home, some of their, um, you know, about their family, personal interests. So I gather that information, one, to help build just a comfort level, and then also I now have had content to write about that's personal to them. So then I go ahead and I review the speech recognition process, that think it, say it, check it, fix it, and then we apply it to the speech recognition process and we write um, sentence by sentence on a personal topic. So I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. Just real quick, so this is an occupational therapist that I work with. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, I have somebody with me that knows the student and that can follow through. But often, if I, especially if they've been taught how to use the speech recognition process, I have them lead and I step back and I kind of coach them teach the editing process after each sentence. Um, on the video, she did say just to keep going. Um, he was doing a great job, so I guess at that point, she didn't necessarily have to stop him and check for accuracy in between. But we do recommend at this early on stage that we do teach the editing process after each sentence. So like I did in that one video where I was teaching the occupational therapist in step two, um, having them visually check the sentence for rec recognition accuracy. One of the times I had her go with her finger under each one. Another time I had her use the text of speech built into the map, um, whatever the student prefers. But then you would go ahead, sentence by sentence, and make the changes as needed. And then we put in here using the keyboard. It's so funny how many times a student will try and turn on the speech recognition just for like that one word correction or to say a comma when they could, if they physically can do it with their hands, we tell them that could be faster to put a comma or a period in with their hands. 
Um, and then teaching that punctuation. Again, that step one of modeling, it's amazing how the students pick up the punctuation so quickly when they see me modeling it. Um, often we don't even have to teach them. But if you notice too in that video with the OT that um, I just kind of like push my finger forward, that's my visual cue or visual reminder for putting a period. I'll do the same thing with a comma. Sometimes I'll even have a visual of the commands that the student's having a hard time and I'll point to them as a reminder. Um, and teach a limited number of voice commands at this time. Usually some of the ones that I'm teaching the student at this time, and again, that I modeled at the beginning, are things like new line, new paragraph, some of those very basics. But they do kind of want to learn those and get off track. I just, uh, the high school student yeah. I was working with today got very interested when I, when I, when he asked whether there's commands. I'm like, yes, you can Google and see where, you know, but I'm like, we're not going to focus on that right now. Yeah, good point. So, <laughs> Let's move on to the data collection for this third step. What we're primarily doing is observing the student's ability to generate ideas um, and form them into grammatically correct sentences. We want to see if they can use a variety of vocab words, maybe not limiting themselves to the small words that they know how to spell, as they might do when they're handwriting or typing, if that's the issue, but really using grade level vocabulary. So you'll see in a video in a little while a sixth grader who demonstrates this. We want to see, too, if the student can create longer sentences in response to coaching. Um, and you'll see the sixth grader that I work with in a video in a few minutes um, doing that, doing, responding very nicely, actually, when I ask her to extend the sentence. Um, finally, we're watching to see if the student can develop the skill of dictating the punctuation or if they still need reminders. And of course, we're still building that skill, so it's not a deal breaker if they don't have those steps here. But we're heading towards the independent use as quickly as possible, so we can uh, mentally sort of take note of that or write it down. For quantitative data, you could count recognition accuracy again, but now you also want to start measuring productivity using words per minute as seen in the DeCoste writing protocol. You could also try applying a readability score to get a sense of how word and sentence length factors into the overall product. It's easy to get this score from online websites, and they're embedded in, in older word processors like MS, Microsoft Word, well, it's not older, but now that we're using Google Docs, I don't have that in it. So you can go online to a website for that. Okay, on to step four, which is write and edit one to two paragraphs for motivating pictures or personal topics. So again, the idea here is to um, provide some extra practice while keeping that cognitive load low, um, being in something that they're interested in, uh, for our younger students, they may need a little more time at step four. For our older students, this might not even be a step that you need to provide. Um, and so this is where also that interview comes in handy. So um, I'm going to show you an example a minute of a student. He just recently told me he went on a beach vacation, and so we looked up images of the beach. And um, so I'll show you that in one moment. But really here, just remember, this is where you're going to continue to coach the think it, say it, check it, fix it process. You're going to gradually fade your coaching. Um, this is where you're going to start stepping back a little bit. And again, Dan's going to talk about the collecting data on independence and writing quality. So here's a video clip of one of my students. And he's writing about a picture that we Googled that he chose um, uh, about the beach. All right, so for data collection on this step, which is really sort of an extension of the last step, um, it's so, so basically the same, the same kind of data collection. Um, the point, of course, is here to give them more practice. So we're continuing to observe the student's ability to verbally create grammatically correct sentences and use speech recognition to transcribe them. I would probably focus more on actually measuring the countable variables at this stage. Um, at this point, you could probably collect enough data to compare the writing quality and quantity uh, using speech recognition with the student's baseline writing output from before when they were either handwriting or, or typing. If there's a significant difference, you would probably already have enough data to recommend implementation with progress monitoring, well, positive difference, and recommend continued training so the student can become independent on grade level writing assignments. In other words, if you're in kind of a rush, this is a step where you can already have enough data to recommend implementation, but more training will need to go with that. In addition to just measuring the student's writing product, though, an important factor to collect data on in any AT assessment is the student's personal preferences. So you ask the student what they think about using speech recognition, whether they like it or not, and why they think it's useful or not. 
the Likert scale from the DeCoste protocols, it's in both the writing protocol and the protocol for accommodations and reading, is a great tool for this if your student needs a visual. Uh, we have a little image of that on the slide. Other um, older students could simply be verbally asked to rate their preference on a scale of one to five. And a lot of times what I do for step four is I will actually, um, the topic that we'll choose to write about is what do you think about speech recognition so far? Often if, um, you know, a lot of times we're restrained by time, so I have one class period to, to go over this with a student. Um, sometimes my first session will end at step four, and I'll, ask, I'll end by asking them, could you write a paragraph about what you think about speech recognition? So here's an example of that. Just a real quick side note about this student. This is one of those students that the staff all along said, the student has such a difficult time writing. He has so many great ideas, but um, he's definitely not a candidate for speech recognition because he has a diagnosis of cluttering, so he stutters his full sentences. So if you have a conversation with him, it is sometimes very difficult to understand him, and he does stutter his full sentences, but it's amazing when he uses speech recognition how clear it comes out. So you just don't know until you try. So let's move on to step five. This is one of my favorite ones to use, especially when the student needs some extra practice and you don't have much time, or when you want to move the student beyond writing about simple topics to something a little more complex, a little more grade level. So this step just uses the age-old activity of writing vocabulary sentences. First, find a list of academic vocabulary words, and it would be ideal if you could get a list from the classroom teacher of the words that the student's been working on in class. But I often just look up a grade level list of vocab words from an online site uh, on my iPad at the moment. I pick a word that the student knows, uh, make sure they know it, and then say, make a sentence with the word, you know, um, fabulous or uh, fantastic or whatever the word is. Continue doing this with five or ten different words, observing the syntax and the structure of the sentences that the student creates, and then coaching the student to create lengthier and more complex sentences. The ability to create grade level sentences is a good indicator that speech recognition will work as a T that brings the student up to grade level. So um, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for in this step here. So I have a video of this as well, of uh, the sixth grader I mentioned earlier. You'll see her create some easier sentences at first, but then really respond beautifully when I coach her to create longer sentences and when I give her more demanding words. Um, you'll see in the, you can see in the picture here that I have the little think it, say it, check it, fix it reminder at the top of the screen how to do the data collection for this. Um, obviously, we're watching the student's ability to create those sentences um, and hopefully grammatically correct complex sentences and stretching the sentences out. What you could measure quantitat quantitatively at this point would be the recognition accuracy and the readability. Um, I might take data on correct word sequences, which is a measurement technique used for curriculum-based measurements of writing. I probably would not count productivity, though, the words per minute, because the writing activity is not continuous. All right, and on to number six, which is write multiple paragraphs after completing graphic organizer um, using keywords and phrases. So the purpose of this step is really now to integrate speech recognition into the whole writing process. Um, and at times I will really model this in step one as well. So again, it's something they see right from the start. Other times it really depends on the student and, and if they're using graphic organizers quite a bit in the class, then of course I do. Um, so and a student who really demonstrates good operational and functional skills in step three um, may move right to this step. So what we do is we help the student identify the topic of interest. And then we help them fill this out, their pre-writing organizer. The key is to teach them, to coach them through um, using keywords versus full sentences here. And, um, and then what we teach them to do is after they fill it out, we coach them to take those keywords and turn them into full sentences. So just like Dan did in the last, um, in the last number five, it's a really nice way to practice doing that. All right, we don't have a video for this step because we're moving on to longer types of writing that would um, not really video very well. Um, but I just want to talk about the data collection you would do at this point. Um, you're obviously looking at their ability to generate ideas and organize those ideas into the graphic organizer. You know, that's pre-writing skills that really are 
sort of separate from using speech recognition, um, but you really want to emphasize can they do one to two keywords on the graphic organizer, which, which is a summary kind of skill and uh, it can be difficult for students. Um, what you could count here would be their level of independence. Um, how many of these steps are they doing on their own without you coaching? So step back, keep your mouth shut and let them do it for a while and see what happens. The recognition accuracy as it comes out. Um, you could do a readability score on the overall product. And now we might want to start introducing a writing rubric score because we're actually writing a more complex, you know, multiple or a, pretty, um, a good single paragraph. Great, and on to number seven. And this is where um, we say the student semi-independently completes a writing assignment using speech recognition. And we say semi-independently because, you know, we want to see what the student can do independently, but we want someone there standby to help troubleshoot with them. And again, this is another great reason to have somebody with you while you're doing the training because it's another great person that can help follow through and give the student support. So this is where we would use an academic assignment if the student is ready or we can still give them a topic of choice if they're not. They would then complete the assignment at school or at home with just that standby support is needed. And I often do this as their homework in between sessions. So I'll say, okay, your homework is to complete this assignment and then, um, and then bring it back. All right, and then data collection on this, did they complete the assignment or not? Especially if you were giving it sort of as homework. And then again, recognition accuracy, and again, a writing rubric score on the product. And then student preferences, especially important if they were completing it not with you or with, on their own or at home or something. How did it go? Did they like using it? Did it help them? I, I usually ask them quite a few questions um, to dig into that part. All right, and on to the last one, which is number eight, where the student independently completes an academic writing assignment using speech recognition. And the purpose of this step is then to collect data on the effect effectiveness of speech recognition. Um, so some students may jump directly to the step from step number three. I'm finding a lot of my older students, like my high school students, they're ready just to jump right from three to eight. Um, if you want observational data, you can watch the student without any coaching at all. The teacher then would grade this assignment just like they would any other classroom assignment using their writing rubric and they collect data on the effectiveness of it and implement and monitor effective use over time. So the data collection for this is the typical final outcome of the product, which is a writing rubric. So just a sample writing rubric on the screen here. Um, sometimes what I love to do, if I can do it, is ask the classroom teacher to score the um, assignment so that they are using the same rubric um, for the pre speech recognition product that they have been doing in class, and the post-speech recognition writing sample that they just um, created. And that helps the teacher to see the difference that it makes as well and give you a little more objective view on what's happening. All right, so those were all eight steps. Again, they're all summarized on a two-sided handout in the appendix. Um, we've mentioned a couple times you can skip to this step you really will know the student best and you'll know whether or not you need to go through each of these eight steps and maybe you need to spend more time on a certain step. It all depends on the student whether you can, you know, what you're going to do as far as um, the time you will take for each step. <clears throat> and what we have done, are, I, you know, I'm really um, big into having, again, a visual for myself, for staff, and for the students. So I've created the student's guide to speech recognition. And what it does on one side, it summarizes you know, the four steps that we go over. It, uh, in here I have a list of all different tips for um, speech, using speech recognition that I go over before we even try it with the students, which I'll show you on the next slide after that. On the back of this, though, is the student speech recognition plan. So what I do is I walk through with the student who did you work with today? If it was myself, you know, we write down Mrs. Key and how to get a hold of me. Um, how did you access speech recognition? They would then, you know, if it is in Google um, Docs, I want them to write down um, tools, voice typing, you know, Google Docs, tools, voice typing, how they accessed it. So they remember how to get go back there. Um, then we talk about what is the type of assignment you're going to use this for. 
And if they don't have anything right now that they're going to use it for, I give them tips on other things they can use it for to practice. Then we talk about that tool belt theory. If, if this isn't available, what are other tools in your tool belt for different writing assignments? Uh, we talk about where quiet place is, both at school, at home, and um, who to contact if they have questions. So just a nice little follow-up. We'll either fill this out online and share it via Google Docs or um, write out a hard copy. And then these are some of those tools, uh, additional tips that we mentioned that, the, that I go over. These, these are just some of the things that I go over with the student. You saw that student mention, don't look at the screen when you're composing. A lot of times students will get hung up on what's getting typed up on the screen and it really distracts their writing process and, and holding those ideas in their head before they get them out. We also talk about don't chew gum, using the earbuds, um, trying to speak at a lower pace, and sometimes even a lower tone will help recognition a little bit. So you can read those here, and that's also in the guide. So finally, just remember that speech recognition, in terms of speech recognition, uh, oral language is different from written language. So that's the whole point of teaching the process to the student. And then it's a good reminder for the classroom teacher that speech recognition is not going to change the student's ability to write or to compose. It's just um, substituting for the transcription demands and the spelling demands. So it's not cheating. Yeah. As we mentioned, we have an entire section for Implement It in the guide. And we just have one slide here for our presentation. But just a reminder to build in that practice time. I tell students that they don't have anything to write about, having a daily journal that you can write about, it, even if it's just one paragraph, three sentences a day that you're going to write about. Or some students really like to write plays or stories. Um, even just answering your emails or your text messages with your voice and remembering to put that punctuation in too, that's often a great way to help um, practice. And then we talk about just making sure you're integrating it into the writing process and having those pre-writing steps and, um, and accommodate their um, writing. There's a whole section, though. Check it out. And feel free to share this with your colleagues. That's, uh, like Kelly said earlier, this is our goal is capacity building. So uh, you don't have to ask us permission. You can make copies of the guide and share it with other people. Yes, please do. Let us know if you have any questions. You can send us an email.